in Mark chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 17 through 31. We're looking at the story of the rich young ruler. Also, I would consider the rich young fool, and you'll see why we call, I call him that or mention him in that way in just a moment. We'll begin reading at verse 17 in Mark chapter 10. I'll read to verse 22, and we'll get into our study. Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 17, reading to verse 22. Mark writes, now as he, was, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then, then Jesus looking at him, slapped him in the face. No, then Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. So as I normally do, I'm going to give to you a, a context. I'm going to lay a foundation for you so you can see what is taking place here in this particular event that is recorded uh, for us in the gospel of Mark. The Bible reveals to us that God is a God who desires to have a relationship with his creation. He desires to have a relationship with people. And it is his desire to save all who come to him, all who come to him in genuine faith. In 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the apostle Peter said, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Not wanting anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. In Ezekiel 33, verse 11, in the Old Testament, say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked should turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? Again, in Isaiah 45, verse 22, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So the Bible teaches that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible teaches us that God desires a relationship with man. And even though we've turned away from him, the Bible also reveals that he seeks for us. We see it in the Garden of Eden at the, in, the, in the beginning, in the first book of the Bible, when God called out to Adam. And when God called out to Adam, he simply said, where are you? In Jeremiah 7, 25, it reads, from the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I have persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them day after day. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He seeks them out from the Garden of Eden to this day. In the New Testament, Jesus is revealed as the seeking Savior, searching for and calling the lost. When you read the, uh, the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, you see this as it's portrayed in a series of parables. You see it when the Lord um, seeks out the lost sheep. When he seeks for that lost coin, you see it when he seeks for that lost son. In Luke 19, verse 10, it simply says, The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. So God reveals himself as a God who seeks, but he also commands us to seek him. In 1 Chronicles 16, verse 11, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. In Isaiah 55, verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. So it is God who seeks us, but it is also God who puts it into our hearts to seek after him. In John 6, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the important part is that under his prompting, we seek him, and we do so with sincere faith. In Deuteronomy 4, 29, You will seek the Lord your God. You will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. 
Now, there are many who have said that they sought God, but they could not find him. And that's not because God couldn't be found. It's because very often they have their own agenda. And this is what we see here. When confronted with a choice, this man decides to walk away. This story is a story illustrating man's unwillingness to trust the Lord. And notice with me, though he initially appeared to be hungry for a truth, the fact is he really wasn't. At first, he seemed to show great interest in spiritual things. But even so, we must remember that interest is not a synonym for complete trust and faith. So today, we're going to be looking at a man that everybody has heard of, the rich young ruler. I simply refer to him as the rich young fool because he turned away and didn't follow the Lord. So beginning at verse 17, once again, it says, As he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, this particular story is mentioned in Matthew, in Mark, as well as the Gospel of Luke. And by combining the accounts of the story, we get a more complete picture of what is taking place. So I'm going to kind of outline these very quickly to you so you can see what's taking place and get a better picture of it. Again, Mark 10, 17 says that he came running, which would seem to reveal eager interest. In chapter 10, verse 17, it says he came and knelt before him. In Luke 18, 18, it says he called Jesus good teacher, which reveals respect and reverence. In Mark 10, 22, Mark informs us that he was very rich, having great possessions. In Matthew 19, verse 20, he's a young man because he says, all these I have kept, the young man said. Again, in Luke 18, in verse 18, it reveals that he's a synagogue ruler, revealing he's an extraordinarily devout young man. He was between the ages of 21 and 28, and he was known for sincere religious devotion. He was the spiritual leader who chose those who read the Torah, the law, in synagogue services. It was he who gave the sermon. He's the one who supervised the services of the synagogue. And one commentator said that this implies that he was part of the council called the Sanhedrin, the most respected rabbis in Israel. In Mark 10, 17, in asking what he should do to inherit eternal life, this reveals that he's a Pharisee. He's spiritually unsatisfied, which seems to have propelled him to Jesus Christ. Notice with me when Jesus says, keep the commandments, he claims to us that he has. So what we have is a rich, respected, reverent, religious young man who is spiritually unsatisfied. He had everything that should have made him happy, but he's lacking something. And it's this emptiness that left a gnawing hunger in his soul. It's this emptiness that kept him awake at night. It's this emptiness that causes him to come running to Jesus and to kneel at his feet. And after everything is taking place here, Matthew sums it up in chapter 19, verse 20, by saying that the young man said to Jesus, I've kept these things, but what do I still lack? I've done all these things. What do I lack? I've done my best to do everything in the right way, but I'm empty. So Jesus is going to answer that profound question, what do I still lack? It says in verse 17, he was going out on the road, and in Matthew 19, 16, Matthew says, Behold, one came and said to him. So when Matthew chose to use the word behold, he treats it as if it's something that is unusual, which it really is. A young religious, rich young man realizes he's lacking something and he comes for help. That's unusual because those who are rich and those who are young normally do not recognize a need. This is an absolute fact. We know it. Those of us who are growing older in life realize that. When you're young, You've got everything. When you're young, you think that nothing will ever go wrong. When you're young, you're going to live forever. When you're young, all your dreams are going to come true. When you're young, you take chances. You're daring. You do things that, that an older person wouldn't do. You think the older people are, are just afraid, but you're courageous. In reality, you're just impetuous, and they've already learned their lessons. So when you're young, you think you're going to live forever. And if you have money... You've got it made. I'm young and I'm rich. I've got everything that I need. I don't need anything else. Ecclesiastes 10, 19 says it like this. Money is the answer for everything. I've got my youth. I've got my health. I've got everything. I've got religion. 
I'm well respected. I, I'm a man of prominence. I'm a young man. Like it says, you know, be, when it refers to him as a young man, commentators, more than one commentator were pointing out that the way that was presented means that his age would have been somewhere, as I mentioned, between 21 and 28. Those of you who are above 28 and admit it, ask yourself, did you not know everything when you were 21? Ask yourself. You know, it's like what Mark Twain said. When I was 17, my father was an idiot. When I turned 21, I was amazed at how much the old man learned in four years. <laughs> when you're young, you've got it made. And when you're young with cash and religious on top of that, and people respect you, they ask you for your advice, and you're a spiritual man, you're a devout man, you've got all of that going for you. That's the condition of this young man. He's a person who's got everything that his society would have promoted as being good. Everything. And so this is a young man who's got money, he's got youth, and not only that, he's a man with dignity. A man with dignity during the time of Christ, a man with dignity and influence, would never run in public. You might find that interesting. But a man of dignity, wealth, influence, never would run in public. You have this in verse 17 where it says, as he was going out on the road, one came running and knelt before him. One came running. That's an unusual thing. That's why Matthew would emphasize it by saying, behold. The reason that the men of dignity would not run is because it was humiliating for them to have to lift their long robes and expose their legs in the Jewish culture. That was a humiliating thing. To look at an old man's legs is also sickening, but <laughs> that's why we should never wear shorts. <laughs> but it was humbling. It was humbling to gather up their long robes and expose their legs. That was considered shameful. That was considered undignified. And by the way, just as an aside, that's one of the aspects of the story of the prodigal son that sometimes people miss. Because in the prodigal son, when that son had taken his portion and had gone to a far off land and had used it up in wasteful living, there's a long story. I don't know if I should go into it. I'll give you a little bit of it. It's not part of my study. I, I just wanted to emphasize one aspect of it. But in the story of the prodigal son, you can read it from what is called a Western theologian's perspective, or you can look at it from the Middle Eastern theologian's perspective. And when you read it from a Middle Eastern perspective, you see a lot of cultural things that you don't, you don't necessarily see with Western eyes. And when this young man took that which was of his father's and asked for it in advance, the norm, normal thing was for the young man to receive his inheritance after the father dies. And so when he says, give me that which is mine, he's actually saying, I can't wait for you to die. I want my money now. And that's why God, everybody's so upset. And so when he humiliated his father in that way, and he took off and wasted his father's inheritance on on, on bad living, well, there was a council in the village that was called, it was, it, they would have what is called the ritual of Ketsatsa. And what that is, is that they would, they would pronounce this young man as the council elders to be dead. And so he was not to come back to the village. And if he came back to the village, great harm could be done to him. That's why the father is portrayed as watching out, looking for the son. Now, the son is there wasting all of his father's inheritance and just wasteful living, and he would have eaten the, the food that pigs ate. And he came to himself and he said, I'm going to go back to my father because even in my father's house, servants are doing better than I am. Now, that isn't the place of repentance for him. That's another scheme for him to come home because he's not living well right now. So he chooses to come, and he's already rehearsed his speech. Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your servants. He's already re rehearsed his scheme. But the scripture tells us while he was yet far off, his father saw him. 
So in Luke 15, 20, the son had decided to return home, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now that people would not understand. We Westerners don't realize it. The father saw him and ran to him. It's a picture of humiliation. The prodigal son was a, was a portion of scripture that Muslim scholars would debate Christians in because they said there's no incarnation in this particular story. The, the boy turns and says, I'll come back to my father and he's welcome back with open arms. But the Middle Eastern understanding would have been this. No, when that father lifted his robes and ran in public to embrace him and protect him against the judgment that was coming, that's a picture of the humiliation of Christ who took upon himself human flesh, dwelt amongst us and bore our sins. And so for this father to run in public, that's one of the things in the aspect of the story that, that is so amazing that a man ran, the father ran. It's the only time you see God run in Scripture. And he ran to embrace the son, to embrace him and hold him and protect him against the judgment that was coming for what he had done. And that's why when that son says, I no longer deserve to be called your son, he doesn't have to go any further because that's where his point of true repentance took place. When I saw my father humiliating himself to protect me from judgment to come, I have sinned and I'm no longer worthy. And that's when the father just says, no. Kill the slot, slaughter the calf, the fatted calf. My son who was lost has come back to me. So that's a beautiful picture of voluntary humiliation. In the Jewish society, the, the, an older man would never lift his robes and run because that was a picture of humiliation. And that is what's taking place here with this younger man, a man of dignity, a man of, of prominence, even as a young man, would never run somewhere. So this is not an accident that Mark... And, Mark includes that description again in verse 17 when it says, he was going out on the road and one came running. It's a picture of an eagerness. It's actually an outward picture of humility, even a willingness to be taught. So he respectfully approaches Jesus. Notice that he calls him, he calls Jesus good teacher. He acknowledges, in other words, that Jesus is a great and respected rabbi only he acknowledges that Jesus is an expert in the Old Testament, that he's a, a teacher of truth. Now, he may have called him good teacher in order to flatter him to gain favor. That's a common tactic, even to this day, to politely flatter someone to disarm them. Well, he says in verse 17, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So the young man believes in an afterlife. He desires to enjoy it. He thought that eternal life was something he could obtain by religious works. That's why he says, what shall I do? What is the most important good work that I can perform to win eternal life? Now, in spite of all his good works, his religious zeal, an effort that he's making to be righteous, he's still empty. What shall I do to have spiritual satisfaction? What must I do to have knowledge of God? You see, eternal life is not length of life. Eternal life is quality of life that extends. In Romans 14, 17, it says, God's kingdom does not consist of food and drink, but of righteousness, peace, and joy produced by the Holy Spirit. What must I do to have quality of life? John 17, 3 says, This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. It's a quality of life that is built on fellowship with God. That's the answer to the question. But for this man, how can I obtain eternal life? How can I be saved? I'm spiritually empty. I need to be filled. How can this occur in my life? I deserve this kind of life, but I don't know how to go about getting assurance of it. Well, in another place, this kind of question was asked of Jesus. In John 6, 28 and 29, they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. What is it that I must do? You must believe in the one whom he sent. You must believe in Christ. Now, notice with me, this is an open door. 
And yet Jesus doesn't take advantage of it. Instead, he seems to make it even more difficult to come to peace with God. By his response, Jesus even appears to be a bit antagonistic. So Jesus questions him, verse 18, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. Why do you ask this question? He's searching out the man's state of heart. He wants to reveal the motives of this man's question. He's forcing the man to see what he is really hiding in his own heart. Very often when Christ would ask questions, it wasn't because Jesus didn't have an answer. When a rabbi would ask questions, it was in order to draw out from that person what they think. That's what questions do. So he's not playing with him. He's asking him something to reveal the state of his heart. Why do you call me good? Tell me what you think. Now, when Jesus asks questions, again, it's intended to draw them out. And we've seen this uh, several times. I, I chose just to look at a few of the questions Christ asked as we've gone through Mark. I haven't listed all of them. There are quite a number of them. But for example, in Mark chapter 8, Jesus had asked a question. Who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? He asked the question. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, loses his own soul? In Mark 9, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? Again, in Mark chapter 10, verse 3, what did Moses command you? When he asks the question, it's not because he doesn't have the answer. When he asks the question, he wants you to supply the answer, which causes you to look within yourself to see what you really believe. That's why rabbis would ask questions. He's probing to find out what this man thinks about him. You see, the young man came to Jesus in a moment of strong emotion. It reminds me of another story in Luke chapter 9 of a man who came to Jesus and what this man said to him. In Luke 9, 57, it says, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Well, it seemed like he was ready to be a disciple, but Jesus responded in an interesting way. And in Luke 9, 58, Jesus replied, foxes have dens, birds have nests but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You don't know what the cost is to follow me. And so I, I'm coming to you, I'm asking you a question, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus' response after the man had called him good, he says again in verse 18, why do you call me good? Are you applying useless flattery to me? Do you re really believe I am who I am? It would seem the young man was applying a polite title to Jesus. He was saying that Jesus was a good teacher, that he recognized that he was one who had come from God. But by asking this question, he's provoking. Jesus is provoking him to rethink the word good. People can be relatively good. People are bad. But only God himself is absolutely good. So do you see me for who I actually am, God in the flesh, or are you just being polite? You see, in verse 18, no one is good but one, that is God. In Psalm 34, verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Psalm 107, verse 1, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. There's no one good but one, that is, God. But he goes on in verse 19, you know the commandments, you're a synagogue ruler, you're, you're steeped in, in scripture, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother, you know the commandments. Now, notice how he refers to certain commands. He wants them to consider what these commandments actually mean. He does this once again to reveal to him that even though he knows them, he doesn't understand them. You see, Paul came to understand that. Paul came to understand that the law demands perfect obedience. In Romans 10, verse 5, Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. So God's commands revealed what we were to do, but they also exposed our weakness 
The will is present, but the ability to perform that which we desire is not. We can't obey them. That's the whole point. We have a weakness, a sin nature, a weakness of our flesh. And that's when Paul realized that the law led us to faith in Jesus Christ. In Galatians 3.24, it says the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. In John 5, 39 and 40, Jesus said, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. See, the law was intended to expose many things. There's so many things you see in the law. I'm just touching on one thing, but it was intended to expose our weakness, our inability to do that which we claim to desire to do. The law says this to us, so it exposes and even gives a name to the things that we're doing and lets us know that these are not pleasing to God. So committing adultery, you wouldn't know it was wrong until God said it is wrong. To steal, you wouldn't think it was wrong. Sometimes you might even think it's a smart thing to do. To hurt somebody, you think it's the right thing to do. We could, we could, we could go in and, and justify pretty much everything we do, but the law says you're not to steal, you're not to kill. Honor your father and your mother. These are things that expose our hearts. Our hearts are not prone to do those kinds of things. Now remember, this young man had just asked him, what shall I do? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. He says, keep the commandments to awaken him to his inability to do so. You see, it's that failure to do so that produces dryness and dissatisfaction in his life. That's why he's saying all these things I've done from my youth up and I'm still lacking something. So again, in verse 19, you know the commandments. If you attempt to keep them, they will reveal to you how unsatisfied you are. <laughs> but the young man immediately responds, verse 20, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Once again, that is an aspect of youth. Because when you're young, you think you're better than you are. It's just the way it is. You haven't had that long to do more sins. When you get older, you realize you're quite sinful. It's the story of when the woman was caught in adultery and, and uh, she was brought before the feet of Christ. This woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Moses in the law said that such should be stoned, but what do you say? And that's when Jesus wrote on the ground and that's when he said, the one without sin, let him be the first to cast a stone at her. You know the story. And as they were standing there holding these, these rocks in their hands, the Bible tells us from the older to the younger, they began to drop the rock from their hand and walk away from the older to the younger. It wasn't the younger. The younger think that they're better than they are. The older realize they're not that good. That's how it works in life. Again, when you were young, many of you are still young, many of you think you are. When you were young, you were much better. You were much faster, you're much stronger, much smarter, much more ambitious, much more plans, I'm gonna succeed, much, much, much more. Then you go through life, you learn lessons. As you grow older, you begin to realize I didn't succeed in all the things I attempted. I didn't do the things that I wanted to do. I never accomplished the things that I want. So you end up buying gold chains in a Corvette. No, I'm just, <laughs> that's my generation. Now, as you grow older, you begin to realize that life in many ways did not turn out the way you wanted it to. But when you're young, your future's still way in front of you. The road before you is still very long. When you get older, the road behind you is long, but the road before you is very short. And you're coming to the end of that road. There's nothing wrong with that. That's aging. And you come to realize, hmm, I have less time before me than I have behind me. What did I accomplish? But when you're young, you can speak with resolution. This young man said, all these I've kept from my youth up. What do I still lack? I've done all these things. I've never failed at them. I've never committed adultery. I haven't murdered. I haven't stolen. I don't bear false witness. I haven't defrauded. I honor my father and my mother. I'm keeping all of these things. But I'm still lacking. Again, Matthew 19, 20 adds, what 
do I yet lack? Well, what he lacks is the assurance of salvation. This young man is like people who have been raised in Christian homes with no conversion experience. There are quite a number of people, young people who were raised in a Christian home who think that they're Christian because they went to church. They're Christian because mom and dad follow God. They're Christian because they were raised in Sunday school, dedicated by the pastor, involved in youth, and the whole nine yards. They think they're saved when in fact they're dry. They go to college and it takes one semester for some atheist professor to talk them out of any faith that they claim to have. That happens all the time, unfortunately. They've been raised in a Christian home, but they don't know what the world's all about. They find out the world seems to be much more attractive than they ever heard. That's actually a revelation of his youth. He thought he actually kept these commands. He was sincere, but he was wrong. He could not have kept all the commandments, yet they had an effect on him. So notice verse 21, Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. One thing you lack. Now, I want you to notice how verse 21 says this. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. So it's the love of Christ for this young man that motivates Jesus to reveal the young man's own heart to himself. It was the young man's lack of love for Jesus that motivated him to walk away. You see, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 19, Matthew adds the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. You see, true faith is expressed through concern for the welfare of other people. So he tells this young man, get rid of everything and follow me. Give to your neighbor, give to the one in need. Come follow me. He says, come take up the cross, follow me. That's a demand, a demand to follow him. In Luke 14, verse 33, it says, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. He's saying, you need to be fully committed to me. The thing that is holding you back is your wealth and your trust in it. You say that you have love for others. How deep is your love going to be towards them? Let's find out. Give up what you have. Give to the poor. Follow me. You'll have treasure in heaven. But verse 22, and this is interesting how it says it this way. It says, he was sad at his word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. That word grieved, when it speaks of going away sorrowful or grieved, that word means uh, to be wearing a frown in his face. It's just a picture that, that shows the way he's looking as, as he's walking away. He's frowning because he had great or many possessions. The word great possession, great means many. The word possessions I looked these things up in the original language. I wanted to see precisely what he was speaking about. The word possession speaks of estates. This man had many estates. He had much land and, and, and holdings. Is what he was a man with a great, great accumulated wealth. And, and his love of wealth and all that he possessed was too powerful to give up. Now, sometimes when people think of wealth, and our society is very guilty of this, when people think of, of wealth, when people think of people being financially off, well, many will say that's, that's evil, that's the evil one percenters and this and that. And just briefly touching this, the Bible doesn't teach that it's a sin to have wealth. Abraham was wealthy. David, the king, was wealthy. Solomon was wealthy. Joseph of Arimathea was wealthy. Zacchaeus was, was wealthy. Many in Scripture had great wealth. The possession of wealth often indicated that God was blessing somebody's life. In Proverbs 13, 21, it reads, Misfortune pursues the sinner, but prosperity is the reward of the righteous. So wealth in and of itself isn't the problem. This man had great wealth, but that wasn't the problem. It's materialism. It's greed. It's the attachment to riches that can be sinful. In Ecclesiastes 5, 10, whoever loves money never has money enough. 
Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. The rich man is asked, how much is enough? And the rich man says, a little more. It's this desire for more. It's the thing that uh, the accumulation and <laughs> very often not even spending, but it's the accumulation of wealth and all that it gives uh, that, that that's where people uh, make their biggest mistake because when you trust in wealth, it produces a false security. You see, when you don't have any money for a doctor bill, prayer becomes a greater tool, doesn't it? It's true. When you don't have a lot of money, you can't afford to go to the doctor. You're on your knees a lot more. That's a fact. And I'm not saying that's bad. It's just a fact. When you have money or you have insurance, then, you know, I'll just go to the doctor. You don't think about it. So what we have as Americans is a lot of prosperity without even realizing it. And I've shared this before. If you have more than one pair of shoes, you're actually very wealthy. If you sleep in a bed and you have a blanket over you, you're very wealthy. If you eat two times, three times a day, you can snack. You're very wealthy. If you have a car, even two or maybe three, you're very wealthy. You just don't realize it because we have a tendency of looking at people like Elon Musk and others who have so much, we think, oh, I'm poor. No, all we have to do is look outside of America for a while, even go into some places in LA or even in our own neighborhoods and you'll see those who really don't have. So many of us are very wealthy without knowing it. We just don't realize it. And, and we, we trust in those things. You know, I have my insurance, I have my finances, I have these things. Well, this, this man, he trusted in his wealth. That's what he did. And according to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, uh, Paul said to Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. You can have an awful lot of money, and then the stock market just crashes, and you lose it all simultaneously. So don't put your hope in wealth. And that's something that goes all the way back 2,000 years plus. So the real danger is that when we trust in, in wealth, we are blinded to eternity. In Luke 12, 15, Jesus said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. In other words, a man's true life is measured by what he is and not in what he has. So this young man's possessions and prestige blinded him to eternity. He loved these things more than he loved the God who had blessed him with these things. So Jesus reveals to the young man that he had failed to keep the command to love his neighbor. If he couldn't keep these commands, he's certainly not keeping the first four. Because these commands that we find in verse 19, these, these commands are man's duties to other men. These are what are called the second table or second tablet. These are man's duties to man. The first tablet was man's duties to God. If you're not keeping your duties to man, you're not keeping your duties to God because your duties to God as you obey those things produces the fruit of caring for others. If you love God, you love your neighbor as yourself. And seeing that you're not doing these things is demonstrating that you're really not keeping any of them. Well, this man here is having a tough time here. Notice verse 23. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And so he speaks to them. He looks around, verse 23 says, and he's saying it's hard because they love the security they have in this life and they trust in the riches. The idea of giving them up to follow God is difficult for them to do. Well, the disciples in verse 24 are astonished. They're amazed. They're astounded at what he said. And so he went on to say it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. When you trust in riches, you're not trusting in the Lord. They exclude one another. It's impossible for a camel to do this, and it is impossible for us to trust in two masters. So you make a choice. You need to choose what you're going to ultimately rely on because whatever it is that you, you choose to rely on becomes your master. In Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. 
For either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and earthly riches, mammon. It, it, it is not difficult to enter into the kingdom of heaven when you do that. Without Jesus, it's impossible. Well, again, verse 26, they're astonished beyond measure. Who then can be saved? Since riches are often a sign of God's blessing and give advantages, well, who can be saved? Well, riches aren't the issue. Dependence on riches is. And so that's why in verse 27, looking at them, Jesus said, with men, it's impossible, not with God, because salvation is a work of God from beginning to the end. In Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, saith the Lord. Delight in knowing me. Well, here comes the apostle Peter. Once again, he's, he's taken a foot out of his mouth to insert the other one. In verse 28, Peter began to say to him, see, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brother or sisters or father or mother or wife or or children or lands for my sake in the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters, mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. We've left all, verse 28. We followed you. Jesus, this rich young man, wouldn't leave anything. But we left everything. And Matthew 19, 27 adds, Therefore, what shall we have? We left everything. But they still have a need. They have a need of discipleship. We've left everything physically physically. But remember with me, they were still arguing about who is greatest. They still needed to learn what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus in verses 29 and 30 says, sometimes coming to me is going to cost you. It'll cost you family. It'll cost you friends. You may lose many who at one time you thought to be your friends, which is true, isn't it? When you came to faith in Christ, perhaps you paid a price like I did. When I came to faith in Christ as a young man, I had a number of friends. We used to have, we used to have a large group of friends. I had a lot, of, a lot of people who hung around together. I grew up in a neighborhood where there were a lot of young guys my age, boys my age. I went to school with them from kindergarten all the way into high school. And they didn't move. It was a time when people would actually keep their houses and pay them off. My mom and my dad had one house for, for 30 years. And then they finally, when I moved out here, they finally sold that home in Norwalk and moved out here. But when you bought a house at one time, you actually stayed in it. You didn't use it as a starter home to build up. What you did is you, built, you, you got a house, it became your house, it was your forever home, and that's the way it worked. And so in the neighborhood I came from, and perhaps like many of you may say the same thing, pretty sure you do, you're able to say the same thing. We grew up in the neighborhood, so we knew all the kids. We knew the kids who were a year or two above us because we played Little League with them or were in the Cub Scouts or whatever. We knew them. We went to school with them and the ones who were younger, one or two years younger. And a lot of times we'd hang around. I had groups of friends. We had numbers of friends, a lot of guys. We'd hang around. We'd do stupid things. We grew up together. It was, it was actually like the Wonder Years, this old show that was on many years ago. That was really my life. I had friends. I had friends like that. We gave them nicknames, you know. We had friends. Then you come to faith in Christ. And suddenly these who at one time were your close buddies, the ones that you shared adventures with, and hung around with, and went hitchhiked to the beach with, and talked about your first dates, and what am I going to do one day when I grow up? I want the ones you dreamed with, the ones you would speak about what you wanted to do as you grew older. I, I had friends. I'd say, oh, one of these days I want to have this. I want to do that. I want to go here. I want to do this. Oh, I one day want to go to Europe. And one day I'm going to go to Hawaii. One of the, and you talk like that. That's what you did. 
What kind of girl do you want to marry? Oh, she's going to be this or she's going to be that. You talk about your plans. You're going to go to school? I don't think I want to go to school. I think I'll go in, I'll go in the Army or I'll do the Navy or what. You had plans. You talked. That's what it was. Well, that's how my life was. Perhaps you had something similar. And then you come to faith in Christ. And when you come to faith in Christ and you start telling your friends, look what happened, man. I gave my heart to Jesus. And all of a sudden, these friends that you were like brothers with, they just start fading away. They don't want to hang with you anymore. And some of them might be so bold as to tell you what I was told. You're a bummer, man. You used to be fun. What happened to you? That's how it went with me. You used to be a lot of fun. Now you just bum me out. What happened to you? What do you mean, what happened to me? You're not the same guy. I'm not supposed to be. What, you want me to stay the same all the time to be stupid and do stupid things with you? No. I grew up, but I gave my heart to God, and they didn't want anything to do with me. And you, you see them peeling away. Many of you have experienced that. That happens because you made a choice. I'm going to follow the Lord, and they didn't want to. And so Jesus speaks about that. But he says, there may be some that you lose. And some of you don't realize this, so I'll say it like this. If you look around here, these people who are seated around you that you don't know, you're on one side over here, you're on one side over there, you don't know everybody in between. You may have the dearest friend you've ever had in your life sitting somewhere in here, yet you just haven't discovered that. I found that out. In a group of people who were strangers to me, I found my dearest friends because they were family in Christ, because we shared the same things. We have the same father. They became my brother. They became my sister. They became my family. That's what Jesus is saying. You may lose some, but you gain so many more. You may have one home, but when you have a brother or a sister who loves you, their home becomes your home. You go and visit them. They make a meal for you. They come and visit you. You make a meal for them. You hang around. You enjoy life. You raise your children. You grow old together. There's nothing like that, guys. There's nothing like that. My, my daughter-in-law, whom I love so much, I love all my, 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 my kids. I shouldn't say it like this, but my Karina has friends. And uh, we were talking a while back, and I said, you know, you, you love, and I named a, some of her girlfriends that I, I love very much myself. And I said, these are your dear friends. And she goes, yeah, yeah, they are. You know, having babies at the same time, raising your kids, hanging around at the park. Those are good things. Yeah. I said, Marie and I have friends like that. One of my friends I've had for 65, 65 years. I have other friends that I've had for over 40 years. Over 40 years in this church. They're family to me. They're dear to me. I gained those things. Even though there were people who were at one time, I would have done all I could to be of help to them who no longer wanted to be my friend. I lost, but I gained. Not only do you gain family, but he says, you need to understand that following me is going to be difficult because you receive all these blessings, but you also, verse 30, they come sometimes with persecution because there's going to be hurt, there's going to be pain, there's going to be loss. You may lose some that you at one time thought of as your friends, but you do gain. In Psalm 27, 10, it says, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Because of the love of Christ and the family, you're going to be blessed in many ways. But verse 31 will close. Many who are first will be last in the last verse. You may appear now to be the last due to persecution and loss. You may lose all that you have. The day will come when you gain everything, while those who thought they had everything will find that in reality they had nothing. In reality, it is they who will be the last. In Psalm 73, verses 3 through 5, it says this, I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, 
They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from the burdens common to man. <laughs> They're not plagued by human ills. He goes on in verses 12 and 13 to say, this is what the wicked are like, always carefree. They increase in wealth. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. Then he finally says in verses 16 through 19, when I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on a slippery ground, on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. So you see, the rich who reject Christ will be spiritually poor forever. But the poor who receive Christ will receive spiritual riches that last forever. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. You have never given up anything. You have gained everything, is what Jesus is saying. And this rich young fool went away, grieved because he had great possessions. He didn't use material wealth. Material wealth used him. The power, the prestige, the honor, all the privileges and pleasures that he had on the face of the earth were more important than eternal life. Jesus doesn't tell every person to do exactly that. You may not have great estates and all. What he's saying is you need to yield whatever is, is, is trapping you and you need to pursue the things that are eternal. And the things that are eternal, well, there's no way that you could ever do anything better than having what God has for you. So don't be a rich young fool. Be a follower of Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that you would work within us.